Okay, fantastic. Um, well, thank you for inviting me to give a talk on seaweed handling and processing. My name is Missy Good. I am the Mariculture Specialist with Alaska Sea Grant, and I'm coming to you from Kodiak. Uh, this presentation is really going to dive into the, the handling and processing and not touch on, on anything else because I know you guys have had a packed day and you, you've learned a lot already. Before I get too far ahead of myself, who are we? So Sea Grant is a national program. There's 34 university-based programs all across the nation. We also have a National Sea Grant Library, a National Sea Grant Law Center, and our headquarter offices in Washington, D.C. In general, we are a partnership between NOAA and the states, um, with different states having different programs. But in general, the Sea Grant mission is to enhance the practical use and conservation of coastal, marine, and Great Lake resources in order to create a sustainable economy and environment. Alaska Sea Grant is a statewide program. You can see in the map on the lower right the communities that we are currently in. Uh, on Alaska is currently vacant, but we do hope to fill that position soon. And, and the communities that we have a presence in change depending on, on staff and where they're located. But in general, we are a coastal program um, with administrative staff in Fairbanks, uh, since we are headquartered within the University of Alaska Fairbanks. So if you want to be a processor, uh, and this could be two different things, right? It could be you are a farmer and you are going into the processing end and marketing end on your own, um, or you are someone who wants to start a processing facility and you plan on purchasing help from farmers, uh, most likely within your region. So these are considerations for either side. Um, if you want to be processing, is there enough seaweed being produced um, that you have access to to sustain a processing operation on its own? Um, can you produce consistent quality? So whatever product you're trying to develop, um, can you do that consistently to, to meet your market and your consumer expectations? Are there local resources that you can utilize? Uh, this could be a facility that you could potentially be in. For example, here in Kodiak, Blue Evolution is the kelp processing entity, but they come in in the springtime and they utilize a custom fish processing plant. And at that fish processing plant, they go through, they take out the fish processing equipment, they do a deep clean, they move in the kelp processing equipment, they process for their season, which is about six to eight weeks. Uh, when they're done, they move that processing equipment out, fish processing equipment comes back in. Is that an option or is there a warehouse that is potentially an op option for you to use or dock space, cranes, really kind of anything you need along the whole step of the way from getting the kelp out of the water, into your processing facility, developing your product and out to your consumer or your wholesaler. Can you reliably transport your product to wherever it needs to go? That could be lifting a broiler bag off a boat to putting it on a truck trucking it somewhere, um, what are those steps and can you do them every single time kelp is coming to the dock? And then can you find a market for what you are producing? And I know Sky just talked about this and she talked about her examples. Um, so what is your market gonna be? Um, what, what are you going for? Then can we get good workers? Uh, processing kelp is very labor intensive. Um, so can you get good consistent workers that are going to show up every day that you need them? Especially considering right now with the way processing is going, it's a short window. And so you kind of need all hands on deck during a short period of time. And then how much money will you earn or lose? How much is it going to cost you? And then how much are you going to make? So really having a fully developed business, can you do that? Do you have that? Or do you need to do that before you even start? As with any uh, food that, that's being produced for human consumption, there are rules and regulations. Seaweed kind of falls into a gray space, though. It's not considered a plant or an animal. Uh, so raw seaweed in its whole form has no specific regulations. And so it makes it a little bit of a tricky, a tricky product. 
unlike seafood, which has thick books on hazards that you need to consider and ways to mitigate those hazards, seaweed doesn't have that yet. It doesn't have that good regulatory guidance. Uh, but process seaweed, um, so this is when you're going to do one more step than just trimming, does fall under the Food and Drug Administration, which regulates any sort of processor activities. And then within the state of Alaska, you then fall under the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation, which regulates uh, all food that's being processed and then distributed for sale. You could potentially fall under two categories as a seaweed processor a cottage food operator or a food establishment permit. Um, I believe Sky has a food establishment permit for what she was just talking about, um, but I'm sure you can talk with her to get some details there. You could fall under a cottage food operator if you are producing a product that has no temperature controls required, such as a dried product or fermented product, um, but this has to be at a very small scale and you cannot sell outside of the state of Alaska. So if you want to go beyond that, you need a food establishment permit. And this is for any kelp that is harvested and something else is done besides just basic trimming of it. It's a product that requires some sort of temperature control. With this, you do have unlimited sales. Um, so you could sell as much as you can produce. And you have the ability to uh, distribute through wholesalers and outside of the state. If you are wanting to create animal feed, you do fund fall under some FDA regulations um, that I don't plan on going into right now. Seaweed can also be added as a food enhancer to other things, other products that you're producing, and it falls into this FDA category as generally recognized as safe, uh, grass. And I don't wanna spend a lot of time going over rules and regulations, so there are some, uh, there's links in a publication that I can send to everybody, but you can also just Google 21 CFR part 184 and read them um, at your leisure. If you are going to be processing uh, seaweeds or kelp for sale, you're gonna have to have a processing facility that is uh, certified and approved by DEC. There are gonna be physical requirements for your facility. These are gonna include uh, water and plumbing. Um, you do need a potable water source. So DEC is going to look at that. There are restroom requirements for your workers. There are very specific requirements for the physical structure itself, uh, such as having uh, smooth, non-permeable surfaces that are easy to clean. Um, and then also waste. You need to have a plan on what you're going to do with the waste that are being produced at your facility. Also, any facility that is um, producing products for human consumption, you're going to fall under good manufacturing practices as well under the FDA and DEC. Um, and then also you can read into this a little bit more looking at the Code of Federal Regulations. We, you would also potentially fall under the Food Safety Modernization Act and preventative controls. Um, however, this is only for businesses who have sales that average over $1 million, but this requires you to have a preventative controls plan, um, which in general is just you're going through, you're identifying what kind of um, concerns and hazards uh, that could happen at your facility with your processes um, all the way till you have a, a fully developed product and you have a plan for mitigating those hazards and then what you're going to do if something does happen, such as a, you develop a product and you have a bacterial contamination and you find that out, then you have a plan to mitigate that. That could be doing recalls of your products, et cetera. There are gonna be labeling and packaging requirements. Uh, some of these requirements include having a name, having a list of the ingredients uh, for your product, potential allergens. A big thing with seaweed is that we can often have uh, crustaceans associated with it, the small amphipods, a uh, little crab, there can be snails. Um, there could be other organisms there. So you do have potential allergens. A, a lot of people have allergens to different shellfish species. Um, so it's important that that is recognized. The weight of your product, uh, name and address of the either manufacturer, packer, or distributor, and a nutritional label. 
I have a couple of examples here on the right. Uh, one, a, a kelp powder with a nutritional label. It's very nicely laid out. Um, this is, you know, could be a potential sticker that you produce then stuck on your product. Or below, here's a package um, from Blue Evolution. The package looks really similar uh, to the Noble Ocean Farms, but again, it's got that same kind of information. There are hazards with uh, developing a food product. All food products have potential hazards that are associated with them. DEC has a food safety and sanitation program and they are gonna require you to, to do some level of education and training. You're gonna have to work with them to decide exactly what that is. In Alaska, uh, Seaweeds do not have to be grown in waters that are tested. Uh, unlike shellfish, which, ha which has to go through uh, water quality analyses, and there's also certain food safety analyses, such as testing for paralytic shellfish toxins and uh, different bacteria, such as Vibro and E. coli. Seaweed doesn't have that. So that's something to consider um, when producing your product, making sure you are doing things safely and they're coming out of clean waters, um, that's gonna fall on you. If you have one consumer that gets sick from your product, it, it could have major implications for your business. And since we're at such a nascent stage with the seaweed industry in Alaska, it could really affect the entire industry. So food safety is, is a paramount con concern. There's a lack of uh, federal guidance uh, for seaweeds and there's not a lot of data out there and so what uh people what the i guess i should say that the industry nationally has started to do is started to look into what considerations should you uh should you have when producing a seaweed and kelp product while we're lacking actual regulatory guidelines and those can include environmental hazards natural toxins uh, microbiological contamination, chemical contamination, decomposition, parasites, uh, possible allergens, physical hazards, um, or unapproved additives uh, into your into your product. Environmental contaminants that we need to consider are heavy metals. These include arsenic, lead, cadmium, mercury, and iodine. These heavy metals are naturally occurring in our waters. Um, there is a level that is going to be there, most likely in the waters that you're growing, but the level of heavy metals in the waters and in the kelp is, is really gonna depend. So it's important to test the kelp in the area um, where your farmers are growing their kelp or where you are growing your kelp. There, there aren't really good at levels um, good guidelines for the amount of levels that you could have in your seaweed and still, still have them safe. Uh, the France Food Code has developed some. I have those in a chart on the table on the lower right. Other concerns include PCBs. Uh, PCBs are a concern in Alaska, especially in old World War II sites where we still have PCBs leaching into the water. Um, so it's good to have your waters tested for those as well. Petroleum residue. If you look at this picture on the right, uh, we see kelp being harvested onto a vessel. And so if you think of your kelp as like a lettuce, you want your lettuce to be on a clean surface. So your vessel needs to be that clean surface. Um, Certainly there are gonna be petroleum products because you're probably most likely gonna be running a, a motor of some sort, inboard or outboard. You may have hydraulics on board. You likely have hydraulics on board. There are food safe um, oils that you can use on board a vessel, such as for your hydraulics. And there are ways to just make sure that your kelp never actually goes into areas that could have potential contamination because we do need to think of kelp as a raw ready to eat product. In many places, pesticides and herbicides are a concern, not so much in Alaska, because we don't have a lot of agricultural runoff that uh, is gonna be coming into our base. So, so yes, maybe think about it, but not, not as much of a concern here. 
There are natural toxins present in the environment. Some of these are produced by phytoplankton, such as paralytic shellfish toxins. There are other bacterial contaminants, uh, such as Vibrio. And these can be present on the blades of, of seaweeds and kelp, but the seaweed and kelp do not absorb toxins. Um, so a good mitigation strategy here is just a rinse. Unlike heavy metals, which uh, kelp will actually absorb the heavy metals. Bacteria. So um, pathogens. We really need to be concerned about pathogens in any food products. These can include bacteria, molds, yeast, and viruses. Bacteria multiply incredibly quickly. They can double every 20 to 30 minutes. However, there are ways to mitigate the growth of bacteria. Um, the bacteria is present in the environment. And you're not going to get rid of all of the bacteria in the environment, but you just mitigate the growth of it. Um, this could be refrigeration, freezing, hot holding, or drying. Keep in mind that freezing and cooking kills seaweed. Um, and so, you know, understanding what your whole, every step of your process is um, till you have your product that's going out to your consumer or your wholesaler. Optimum temperatures for holding anything to prevent bacterial growth is below 40 degrees and above 140 degrees. So ideally, your kelp is not really getting into that range before you stabilize it. You don't want it to be in that range between 40 and 140 degrees because you are going to start to get bacterial growth. Um, and so keeping it out of that window as much as possible. You can use ice to keep temperatures cooler um, as the kelp is being transported to different places. But keep in mind, you do not want ice and you do not want fresh water actually touching your kelp. This can cause blistering, um, which just makes it not as appealing of a product. Uh, dried products need a water activity level below 0 0.85. Uh, this is a measure of how much water is available for microbial organisms. And there's different ways to test for water activity, um, but it mostly requires sending your product in to have a lab analyze it. And then sanitation, making sure you are, are clean, um, your surfaces are clean, the transportation vessels clean, the however you're moving your product is, is clean and sanitized. Um, your processing facility certainly needs to be clean and sanitized and having developed sanitation plans. Molds and yeast uh, generally die with heat treatments. They're not very tolerant to, to, to high heat levels. Um, there's also different products that can kill molds and yeast. yeast. And then viruses. Viruses need a host uh, to thrive, but people are our hosts. Uh, we bring viruses all over the place. So making sure you um, use the proper PPE as you're processing um, your kelp, you know, wearing a hairnet, wearing masks, wearing gloves. Gloves are very important as you're handling your food products. Oh, sorry. And it is illegal to have adulterated foods. So as you're developing your processing line, uh, again, kelp is very labor intensive to process. Make sure that uh, you have means to mitigate anything getting into your food, such as metal and glass. And you have ways to check for the addition of metal and glasses. I mean, this could be a, a knife tip breaking, right? If we're cutting, um, cutting the kelp, you could get little shards of metal in there. Do you have a way to uh, test for, uh, scan for metals within your packaging? Or do you have a system in place where you check every X package, make sure it's not adulterated with the addition um, of other objects that shouldn't be in there? So these are all things to consider, really just in any food processing. And certainly applies for seaweeds. Uh, and allergens. Again, like I mentioned, allergens are a big one, especially with the high possibility of crustaceans and shellfish being in the product. Kelp make great habitat. As it grows, it starts to attract more and more critters. Um, it could be 
a fish that's around, a juvenile fish love kelp, or at your processing facility. There is uh, different, different proteins that are associated with fish um, that can have issues with people that have fish allergies. And so making sure your equipment is fully cleaned, if you are using a, a custom processor, making sure your raw ready to eat product is not touching equipment that has been processing fish is incredibly important. And also uh, shellfish can prevent kosher certifications. I don't know yet of anyone that has gotten a kosher certification for seaweed because of the likelihood of having amphipods and shrimp and crab um, in your kelp. So considering those, you really need to have good steps to sort and remove any potential additions. Whether you are a farmer trying to get your product to the processor or you're a farmer processor, so you have to think about your flow of harvest to dock handling. There's a short window before kelp starts to degrade. We have about 24 to 48 hours from the moment that the kelp is out of the water to you stabilize it before it starts breaking down. Kelp also doesn't like uh, freezing temperatures. Freezing kills it, like we mentioned. It doesn't do well in high temperatures either. And we have that bacterial growth range um, of 40 to 140 degrees. Uh, we don't want it to be within those temperature zones you know, as much as possible. So it's important to choose timing of when you will harvest. Uh, for those reasons, you don't want to be pulling your kelp out if it's going to freeze on deck. Uh, you don't want it to be in, in hot, dry air. I mean, not that Alaska gets that hot, but it's warm, right? Like 40, if you get 50 degrees, 60 degrees, you're starting to get outside of that good temperature window. You also don't want fresh water getting on it. So the more you can avoid when it's heavy rains, um, the, the better you're going to be. And the timing thing is also important because as your kelp is growing or as that farmer's kelp is growing, the later you get into the spring and early summer, the more other animals are going to be associated with it, that biofouling. So timing is super important. And then what's going to happen on board the vessel? Are you just cutting it off the lines and throwing it into a tote or a brailer and then transporting it? Or are you removing the stipes at this point? Um, or if you're harvesting bull kelp, say you're growing bull kelp, how much are you going to cut it off? Are you going to cut the blades off and then leave the, the harder structures, the bulb and the, the stipe in one section? Or are you going to cut that up? So those are considerations for yourself as a processor, what do you want when it hits to the dock? And as a farmer, can you do this on your vessel smoothly and efficiently um, as you're harvesting? You could be harvesting thousands, if not tens of thousands of pounds. What stages are you removing debris and biofouling organisms? Um, what can you do while on board the vessel, while in transport to make sure you have as clean of a product or raw, ready to eat food as it hits the dock? Um, and then if you're hitting a dock or a tender, how are you gonna store it? And how are you gonna transport it? Are you gonna be in a brailer bag? Are you gonna be in a tote? Do you have lids for your tote? Are your totes sanitized? You don't want to be using totes that have recently had fish in them without doing thorough cleaning and sanitation measures to make sure all of those fish proteins are out. And can you transport things within a, a timely manner? Here are some pictures of an example of what could happen for harvest techniques. On the lower left, we see uh, it's a harvesting vessel. Um, this is kind of like a floating barge vessel. The grow out lines are being winched up onto the vessel. A hedge trimmer is then being used to cut the blades off of the line. Those blades are then falling into a brailer bag. And then once that brailer bag is full, it's tied shut and it's pushed overboard. Um, brailer bags full of kelp float. So that's pretty convenient um, in that you can have it floating there. Now it is back into the environment it wants to be in. It's back into its growing waters. So there you have some happy, happy kelp. But you also have to be careful not to compact it too much. It's not going to want to be squished and compact 
impacted. So understanding how much you can fill into your brailer bag and then, you know, having this good storage method of while this vessel is continuing to harvest, this kelp is staying nice and happy in its waters. Then how are you getting it to the dock? Um, these ones are towed uh, to the dock. There's not a long transport um, to get from the harvest area to the dock but you may have a different situation. You may have miles to go. You may have hours of travel. Do you have the vessel space on board to transport your kelp um, in a way that, that keeps it as a good, good product? And then when you get to the dock, how do you get it off? You may or may not be using a brailler bag. You will come up with your own system, your processor. Um, if you're selling straight to a processor, may have different requirements. Um, but how do you get it off of that vessel? If you just fill a fish hold full of kelp, um, can you easily get it out of that fish hold? Now, the brailler bags as, uh, is a good example of an easy way to, to get it off a vessel onto a dock, and then where's it going to go? Um, how much is going to be processed in that day? So you have, also have to have an understanding of how much kelp should be coming to the dock. As you as the processor, how much can you process in one day? You have that 24 to 48 hour window, so you can't have your kelp just sitting around. You can certainly store it short term in a tote on the dock until um, it goes to that next step. But can you get through the right amount? Um, if you end up having kelp on the dock for three days, you may have a bag of slime. And nobody wants that. So once we go from harvesting our kelp, we've transported it now into the primary processing facility. There are some things to start considering. Um, Sorting and cleaning are probably going to be some of your most labor intensive activities. It takes a lot to sort and clean through kelp. And you have to have a facility that you have either designed or organized. So that way you have an efficient flow of getting your kelp into the facility. You get it sorted, you get it cleaned, you get it moved to that stabilization step than packaging or doing your value added um, additions to it or changes, whatever, whatever you are doing. And so when you're designing your facility or you're taking a facility that's, that's already built and you're designing your, your steps, there are some things to consider. How much is this gonna cost? Uh, one of your biggest costs may be labor. Um, if you're processing a lot of kelp, you could have a lot of people on your processing line, um, going through all of your kelp, making sure there's no amphipods, cutting away the hold fast, separating stipes, cutting blades into certain lengths, um, cutting away the, the ends of the kelp, because as the kelp's growing, the ends are dying, they're sloughing, they're also getting organisms that are starting to come live on them. Um, rhizoans, hydroids, the other organisms that are just in the water and associated with kelp. So you're gonna be cleaning, you're gonna be sorting, you're gonna be rinsing. Um, this is a good stage where you're gonna be rinsing. So you wanna make sure that you have a process and equipment to wash the volume of kelp that you wanna process in that day or in those hours, uh, whatever that is. You need to decide and make sure you have the appropriate scale of equipment. And also consider what are you rinsing your kelp with? You can rinse kelp with fresh water, um, but you don't ever want let fresh water sit on it. You don't want to soak it in fresh water. Something else you can consider um, cleaning your kelp with is parasitic acid. Parasitic acid is a super common cleaner in the produce industry um, and has shown to work well with kelp. Um, so then you're going to, you know, this is a good stage for, for killing some of those bacteria that are associated with kelp. There have been major outbreaks of salmonella um, that have gotten a lot of people sick, uh, that it's been associated with seaweeds. Uh, so there is, um, there is examples out there, people getting sick from bacterial growth from seaweed that has been allowed to, you know, stay in a situation that allowed for bacteria to proliferate. Also for your processing line, how much space does it require? You want to be as efficient as a possible as possible. Um, and can you do this in a small space? Can you have an assembly line that pushes your cup all the way through every step? So think about the space that's required for whatever you're doing for your stabilization step. And then how easy is your equipment to clean? 
Um, you need clean, non-permeable surfaces. There's going to be other requirements that DEC has for your processing facility. But you don't want to spend your whole day processing and then spend another day cleaning. You should have things designed to be as as um, cleanable as possible and as efficient as possible. You know, have le a lean management plan so that way your cleaning chemicals are right where they need to be. You're, you have a sanitation station set up in the appropriate places to make it easy and as fast as possible. And if you have never processed seaweed before, it sticks to everything. It's pretty messy. Um, so you want to be able to get it off of whatever equipment you're using so you can clean it for your next day or your next steps, whatever, um, whatever your plan is. You also need to have the appropriate detergents. You need food grade detergents that are not going to leave residues behind. And then whatever equipment that you're using, can it dry completely when it's not in use? If you have um, equipment that can't dry well, there could be moisture, moisture, warm building. That causes a great situation for, again, bacteria and other pathogens to proliferate, and we don't want to see that. When it comes to stabilizing kelp, we have uh, several different options. Some of the common ones are blanching, uh, freezing a raw product, or drying. Uh, when it comes to blanching, you want to blanch at 170 degrees or higher. That 170 degree mark is for a uh, killing pathogens. That, that is the that is a temperature that is set within the food industry to make sure you are, are killing anything that's going to be associated with it, with your food products. Um, but you don't want to overcook your kelp. So making sure, you know, you have the appropriate temperatures for for what you want to do. But 170 degrees is that appropriate mark and making sure that your water is actually at 170 degrees. In the picture on the upper right, um, that's uh, Chris Sanito, our seafood technology specialist, and that's a steam kettle. Uh, and we are actually blanching kelp in that kettle. And in that picture, he is uh, checking to see what that temperature of that water is. For a water ke kettle, we have found that a ratio of one to three kelp to water is the appropriate amount to make sure that you, your water will stay at that 170 degrees. If you have hot water, and you put in a bunch of cold kelp, that water is going to, that water temperature is going to decrease. So you need to make sure that you have that appropriate ratio that you're killing the pathogens. Uh, water kettle blanching, um, just boiling water, that is an option. Or a uh, steam belt is another way to do it as well. Uh, steam belt, uh, steam belt conveyor systems are again, a popular system within the produce industry. Um, that's what Blue Evolution he uses here in Kodiak, and they're processing 12 to 15,000 pounds a day with that. As far as times go, uh, we've seen that two to three minutes for sugar kelp is, seems to be an ideal spot without overcooking um, your kelp, and three to five minutes for ribbon kelp. That blanching inactivates the enzymes that are found in kelp, so it doesn't uh, degenerate, it doesn't degrade and rot. It destroys the pathogens. It also fixes the color. So it, kelp goes from brown to this like beautiful, vibrant green. And that's because the pigments that are associated with the brown kelps that give it the brown color, they denature and they leach out into the water when blanched, but chlor the chlorophyll remains. And so the chlorophyll is that bright green. If you overcook your kelp, it will go back to brown. And it would be kind of this greenish, greenish brown, not a very appealing color. Um, and as a, a ready to eat product, you, you want that nice appealing color there. You want to meet an industry standard of having the, this nice color. If you've eaten a seaweed salad, which is, is not one of these species of kelp, but people associate kelp with a bright green, vibrant color. Um, and so it just makes it a more of an appealing product. Also, if you overcook it, it starts to get kind of slimy and doesn't have as good of a texture. Once you have a, a stabilized product like blanched kelp, there's a lot of other value added processing that you can do with it. One example is creating a, a puree. And this, um, this picture here is actually 
taken out of our seaweed handling and processing guidebook that we have. Uh, it's a free guidebook available on our website, and I'll have a link to it here a little further on. This piece of equipment is an Urschel food processor, so it's an industrial uh, proce uh, industrial blender um, from, again, the produce industry that makes a really nice ground product and comes with different blades for different sizes. This is perfect for creating um, pestos. It, I love the oyster Rockefeller um, that Sky was just talking about. I love doing a kelp fondue, uh, and the pureed stuff is perfect for that. Uh, but you could also use that with the, the new and improved uh, uh, Oyster Rockefeller with the kelp. Um, another method for stabilizing is freezing. So you could freeze either your, your raw product or the blanched product. Um, it's, this is a common way to store uh, blanched and raw kelp is to, to package it and then freeze it. You do have to consider that kelp has a 90% uh, moisture content. And you could be shipping a lot of water if you plan on shipping this. Um, so you need to know how much you're gonna be producing so you can freeze it quickly. You do wanna freeze as rapidly as possible. Blast freezers are super common in Alaska for the seafood industry. They come in 20 and 40 foot containers. Um, so how much are you gonna be processing during a day? How much space do you need um, for your frozen product? Uh, space is money, space is time. Um, so that is a, a major consideration. Uh, another way to stabilize your kelp is to dry it. Um, this is a, a great means for reducing your volume um, and adding value to a product. Again, 90% water content means that you're going to go from a large volume of kelp to a relatively small volume of kelp. You can use dehydrators, ovens, uh, forced air dryers, or static air. Static air being just uh, drying. This could be in a hoop house um, or another outdoor venue. But volume here is key. How much kelp do you have um, and how much kelp do you need to process will determine what methods you can use for your drying. Are you just drying a little bit for, for your home use? Yeah, maybe you could use a countertop dehydrator or an oven, works great um, for drying kelp. Or are you trying to work at a commercial scale? Um, the racks here on the upper right, we've been using a commercial smoker. Um, to dry our kelp, no smoke added. Uh, and so this is a racking system. This is a racking system that then gets wheeled into the smoker, dries, and then we pull it out. We do have some recommendations on times and temperatures in the, that guidance book um, that, that anyone is, is free to download. But uh, you want to test your products too, right? You want to make sure you're getting a product that you really like, that you are um, you are happy to sell to your customer. You're proud to sell to your customer. It looks good. It's consistent. You have want a consistent flake. Um, you also need to make sure. Um, so once you have, you know, your volume that you want, you have your equipment identified for what you want, um, then you need to make sure you are drying it fully. If your kelp is not fully dry, which means it has a water activity level of 0 0.85 or less, you will get molding. And mold is obviously not good on your product. You're gonna get bacterial growth. Again, not good on your product. Um, it could make people sick. It's not appealing. It's not safe. Um, so you do need to make sure that whatever your equipment is and your processes, that you are developing a product that does not have a high water activity. And highly recommended to run trial batches. Don't buy equipment and then bank your entire season on something without running the trials first. So that's super important as well. Get your product tested. Um, so the Kodiak Seafood and Marine Science Center is the designated processing authority for the state of Alaska. So if you're working with DEC to design and develop a product and they wanna make sure your product is safe, they will often recommend that you send it to our facility where our seafood technology specialist and we have a food safety person comes in and uses specialized equipment 
to make sure you have a shelf stable product that's safe for consumers. And your recovery rate for a dried product, again, is gonna be five to, five to 10%. So if you have 100 pounds of seaweed, you're gonna end up with five to 10 pounds of a dried product on average. And you need a good business plan. Start with the business plan first. Understand um, how much your initial investment costs are gonna be, your annual operating costs, um, and, and know what your potential sales are gonna bring you in revenue. Are you gonna, if you are gonna be in the red for a couple of years, are you gonna be making your way out to where you're in the black, where you're gonna be making a profit? Um, there are different services out there to help you develop a good comprehensive business plan. Um, we have a couple of recommendations if anyone wants them. You are not going into this alone. There's a lot of resources. There are great people out there that have already started processing that have been really open um, with their processes, their struggles, Sky, I know, is right there in the room with you, and she's already shared quite a bit. Uh, Barnacle Foods has been really open. Blue Evolution and Seagrove are both processing, and, and they have been pretty open. This is a new industry, and right now it seems like most people are wanting to see growth and are not being top secret. But some of the other resources that are out there, um, like I mentioned, there's a seaweed handling and processing guidebook that we developed. This is available on our website as a free download, um, or you can you could purchase a printed copy for a pretty nominal cost. There are several reports that have uh, been done through the McKinley Research Group um, that I'd recommend taking a look at. These are listed here. I'd be happy to send PDF copies if anyone wanted them. Or you could do a Google search or go to the AFDF, Alaska Fisheries Development Foundation website. There's copies there as well. And the seaweed handling and processing guideline, it not only walks you through the steps of, of, of processing and considerations, we also have a seaweed processing technology list. And we try to design this equipment list to meet different scales of processors from up to 100 pounds to thousands of pounds to tens of thousands of pounds. So if you want to have some links, uh, for example, to some uh, kettle blanchers or uh, steam conveyor belt blanchers, those are in there, cleaning equipment, that's all in that technology list. And that's a part of this guideline um, is available online. It also has examples of HACCP plans, hazardous analysis, critical control point plans. Um, so these are the plans that step you through. Um, what are your potential hazards? How are you gonna mitigate those potential hazards? And if that unfortunate event happens where that hazard does occur, what, what do you do? Um, to then make it better. It has some hazardous analysis worksheets in there. It has an example sanitation uh, operating plan and it has some product label examples um, as well. And there's the, the link, thelastcigarette.org slash bookstore and you can find those. There is also some training that is occurring so we offer, Alaska Seaweed offers a seaweed handling and processing workshop. That next workshop is April 19th through 21st. So next month, uh, here's some pictures from that class last year. The application period technically closed yesterday uh, for this workshop, but we haven't reviewed applications yet. So if you are interested in taking this class, it's a three-day hands-on class in Kodiak. Um, and you have an application in by the close of the workday on Monday, we, I promise we will look at it. The topics covered include an overview of the industry, uh, a much deeper dive into regulations and permitting, uh, processing economics and business management, different types of processing equipment, stabilization techniques, packaging, uh, food safety and value added product development. A uh, nice thing about this course is we do have commercial scale processing equipment that you will be using when you take this class. Um, we also have uh, some representatives from some high pressure processors coming in to talk about the kind of a, a new 
new type of technology for making sure you have a safe product um, by doing this high pressure processing. So that should be uh, interesting. It is a $600 uh, registration fee or application fee. However, there's travel scholarships available for this. So you would have to pay the $600, but we can get you here from anywhere within the state of Alaska. Other courses that are not exactly seaweed, but, um, but do help and could be required um, for developing a processing industry is Better Process Control School, uh, based up HACCP classes, that's at Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point, um, and Sanitation Control Procedures. That Sanitation Control Procedures Workshop is April 28th here in Code GAC. And these other classes have uh, mostly passed. There's one, a HACCP class, March 24th coming up, and that's online. Um, but we offer these classes every fall and spring. So you just check our website to see when the next ones are coming out. So we will offer them all again in the, besides the seaweed handling and processing, we'll offer the others in the fall. And all the classes that take place um, in Kodiak, we do it at the Kodiak Seafood and Marine Science Center, which is, uh, is a, a facility that was designed to support the seafood processing industry. Um, and with that, we are bringing in seaweeds into that. We have a pilot processing plant. We have processing equipment that's at a large commercial scale. We have a test kitchen. Um, so there's a test taste testing room on the back of this kitchen to do fun things. Um, labs, walk-in freezers, pretty cool facility. As I mentioned, we're the, uh, we're the designated processing authority for the state of Alaska. And as such, um, our faculty and staff have worked on developing a lot of different products. Uh, so a lot of Pollock byproducts, doing protein extractions. We have a really stinky protein extraction project going on currently. Um, so if you're here, you can smell it. Um, some other fun things, salmon oil, seal oil, doing acidified seaweed work, uh, kelp tortillas. So this picture, uh, the picture in the middle is some of our dried seaweed that we did. Dry, it's dried kelp um, and sugar kelp. And the picture on the left is some tortillas that's being made with it uh, at Taco Loco in Anchorage. We've also done the like antler tea. We do PSP testing here um, quite a bit. It was involved with product development. Um, our staff and faculty, faculty are also um, available to help you as you're thinking about things that you want to make. And we could do uh, process validation analyses, uh, water activity level. We have a really a small, super expensive piece of equipment that tests water activity within a minute. Um, do water phase salt, pH, microbial testing, and then and really this is all looking at shelf life. And with that, because I can't see you, I'm going to exit out of this screen. I will take questions. Yep, yeah, thanks, Missy. Um, while I'm pulling up Nate from Blue Evolution, does anybody have any questions for Missy? Can't find everyone. So uh, the documents that you were showing, Missy, uh, the processing and handling stuff, I'm going to send that all to you. I already have it in a folder, so it's ready to go. And um, along with Missy's contact info and a few others, and um, I think um, the sun being outside is weighing on everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much, Missy, for all of that great information. I learned a lot, actually, myself from all of that. All right, Nate, I've made you a presenter. Go ahead and give it a crack. All right, looks like I just need to select a few things here and then I'll share my screen. Give me one moment. Okay, and Nate is again with Blue Evolution. It's in Kodiak and um, Nick sells them his kelp. Uh, and so they do the processing and product development there. And um, oh my God, the sun is literally wants us to leave. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because the screen is getting so hard to see. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Sorry for the delay. I know you're at the end of a long day um, and a cooking presentation, it sounds like, coming up, our demonstrations. So 
let me get started. I think this will build really nicely um, for the information that Missy Good just uh, walked everyone through from a process standpoint. It's very similar. Um, but my name is Nate Schlachter. I'm Vice President of Operations with Blue Evolution. We're a buyer processor of uh, kelp on Kodiak Island um, is our operation in Alaska. And I'm gonna take some time uh, you know, walking through our process as a business, um, setting up in Kodiak, and then um, where we're headed in terms of product development and maybe a little bit of market in information that I'll share from our perspective, and then wrap up uh, uh, kind of walking through a day in the life of kelp processing from harvest to uh, end product. And I'll share first here in the backdrop that we, you know, we've been in Kodiak since 2017, but as a company, uh, we started in 2014 uh, in Baja, Mexico, where we operate to this day, a land-based uh, cultivation model, uh, growing and processing olva or sea lettuce, a green seaweed that grows very rapidly, can be harvested year round um, every four days. And it was really Nick Mangini um, and our founder, Bo, who kind of got linked up um, before 2017 that brought us to Kodiak. So we've been in Kodiak since 2017. Um, we partnered with KSMSC and the pilot plant there in our first year uh, to process um, a, a very minimal amount of kelp. Um, since then, we've worked with a couple of the canneries in town, and then for the last four years, this will be our fourth year, we've been working with the Shunak tribe-owned facility uh, called Wild Source. It's about a 2,500 square foot facility, and it's been a really good partnership where uh, this cannery kind of has a shoulder season that starts mid to late April through uh, mid-June. And so um, our model is we come in, we, we have all of the uh, processing infrastructure of equipment and obviously uh, the protocols for how we're processing. And then the entire wild source uh, team just comes under our management for that six week period of time. And it's been um, a really nice way for us to operate um, without having to own a physical space. Um, so to date we've, um, process just um, nearly a million pounds um, processing to a frozen, frozen form, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, we, we're you know, employing around 18 people um, every season. And for us in Kodiak, it was you know, a number of factors that drew us to the area. I think it's a prime area for growing kelp, um, both sugar kelp and ribbon kelp, as well as bull kelp. Uh, it's the access to clean energy, wind energy on the island, which appeals to us, and then the existing infrastructure, um, piggybacking on what's there because of the fish industry. So today we are buying from four independent farms. While we do hold a permit with um, Blue Evolution, uh, we're not utilizing that. Our business model is really wanting to focus on buying from independent farmers. So those four farmers are uh, Alf Cryer and Lexa Meyer, Nick Mangini, uh, Talif Monson, and Adelia Merrick, and then uh, John and Carrie Bateman. And currently we're purchasing on a grade A food spec. So what that looks like is uh, at the point at which our farmers are taking seed from our hatchery, we sign contracts for the next year. So that's usually starts in October, November, um, but the harvest activity won't happen until that next calendar year. But we sign a contract that then has um, a grade A food spec sort of spelled out things like what we want to see in terms of um, the, not just the quality of the kelp, but what we don't want to see. So uh, stipe, hold fast, line, um, bycatch. And so it, in theory, our farmers and as us as a processors kind of understand what we're aiming for. That's a really high standard, the grade A food spec. Um, we're utilizing a lot of uh, technology and processes from um, the salad industry uh, based upon folks within our organization. And not every crop is a grade A crop. And so coming behind that is we're working really actively to open up grade B markets so that we can um, have flexibility in our purchasing. And I think that gives um, not just some assurances, but confidence within for our, our farmers that they know that we're going to be able to buy everything that they 
they are able to uh, grow and bring to the dock. So this slide just shows a little bit of where we're at today and where we're headed. Uh, so current food offerings on the left, uh, I mentioned the sea lettuce growing out of um, in Mexico, um, ribbon kelp and sugar kelp from a culinary perspective as we're um, selling into both the restaurant food service industry as well as the food manufacturing industry, we refer to them as Alaskan kombu and Alaskan wakame. And that's just to help orient people around this type of seaweed or kelp. Um, it's not an apple to apple comparison in terms of the Japanese kombu or wakame. There are differences, um, but I think we found this to be a very effective way in helping um, both chefs or manufacturers understand the ingredient and to connect that with eaters. Today, we're, uh, we're processing to a quick uh, frozen uh, form, which I'll talk about in just a moment. In Mexico, we're processing to a dried and fresh form, and we're moving into 2023 uh, to be able to dry kelp as well. And then as you kind of move down the gradient here, um, this is what allows us to get into grade B markets. We're doing a lot of research and development um, around both companion and livestock um, feed additives, um, as well as methane reducing feed additives. And then looking further into the future, it's you know things like bioplastics and uh, textiles, ag stimulants, proteins, things like that. So our product form um, for the last three or four years has been a one pound whole leaf ribbon kelp or sugar kelp. That's what you see on the left side. That's really designed for restaurants. It's in a pack size that most restaurants can utilize. We put, it's a 20 pound uh, case. So 21 pounders per case and uh, it's ready to eat. So different chefs will um, take different preparations with the kelp. Um, it's very mild, um, which they like. It gives them a ton of versatility and it gives them the ability just to put their creative touch on, on the preparation. We also offer that same whole leaf form in a 15 pound pack. And then I think it was two or three years ago, um, Missy kind of referenced the, the, the Urshel Comatrol grinder is that we, we put up inventory in a five gallon frozen pail, which is 35 pounds of puree. And that's really designed for an industrial um, buyer. Um, but most food manufacturers are utilizing dry and wet ingredients. And while we've been waiting to activate a dry product, the puree is a sort of a, a stopgap in between so that we can reach those markets. In terms of our process, um, everything has been focused on quality. Um, from the standpoint that I think we all should have is that we need to put Alaskan kelp on the market, Alaskan seaweed on the market is the highest quality kelp in North America. And I think what keeps us up at night is it's just one um, mistake, you know, one contamination, one recall that really um, could impact an entire industry in the state, not just our business. And so we've made deep investments around quality and food safety. So we have a full-time quality assurance manager on staff. Um, it is her role um, to wear the mantle of food safety and to make sure that in my capacity as operations that we're adhering to good manufacturing practices, um, that we're um, intentionally putting ourselves under the food safety modernization act that we have has a plan in place um, some of the other things that are really aspirational that i think are helping us in in the marketplace is we're seeking certifications um, so we achieved organic certification last year um, but it's other things like gluten-free halal non-gmo um, sometimes people laugh they're like well why would you need these things but these are the certifications that um, buyers want to see for the products and so um you know where you can't add quality you can only preserve it it's like we we only have one moment to get this right and it's that period of time where the kelp hits the dock goes through our plant reaches that final format frozen form you know that's our chance to make sure that we put up the best product possible so in the last few minutes of my presentation um i thought i'd just walk you through sort of our stuff Hopefully this is a, a nice bookend to some of the different um, processing um, possibilities that Missy spoke about. So we, we um, sort of 
match up with the farmer at the point where the farmers have harvested the kelp. They've placed it in Nomar bags, which is kind of our preferred grailer bag, which you can see there on the bottom left. And then we contract a tender uh, to pick up the kelp and bring it to the dock in Kodiak. So two of our farms are close into town farms. I mean, we're talking 10 to 15 minutes um, to the dock, which is amazing for us as a processor because it means that the kelp that's harvested is as little as four to eight hours um, before it's on the dock and, and ready to go through the plant. We have two additional farms that are on the other side of the island. And this is really a challenging logistics element of just getting kelp that will take more than eight hours um, travel time back to the dock. And so we take great steps in making sure that we place no more bags in insulated totes, that we flood those with um, water pumped by the tender on the farm ground so it's nice and clean. And it's two things, it's keeping the kelp wet, it's keeping it cold, um, and hopefully in the state in which it's most close to before it was harvested. At the dock, um, we're taking weights, um, we're doing an initial inspection um, and then we're headed into um, the processing facility. First step in our processing facility as we cut the kelp, um, it, this is to get it into a, a, a format or size that's a little bit more manageable for us to work with because sometimes it can be upwards of 20 or 30 feet long. We do a fresh water wash. Um, this is intended to um, again, remove anything that we don't want to see in the final product. From the wash, it goes through an inspection line. Um, so we're hand um, inspecting for things like hold fast or line, um, shrimp, things that we don't want to go through the blancher. So like Missy mentioned, uh, blanching is a stabilization step. It stops the enzyma enzymatic activity that's going to lead to spoilage but it also turns the kelp into this beautiful green color, which is, um, I think, appealing to most buyers. Uh, we use a steam blanch process in our plant. From the steam um, blanching process, the kelp exits on a conveyor, um, and then it's ready to go into a packed form. On the bottom left, we use a uh, roll stock uh, for our one pound whole leaf pack. We use vac vacuum bags um, in a vacuum sealer for the 15 pound, and then I referenced the five gallon pail for the puree. We own all of our own equipment. Um, we've made massive investments um, in the type of equipment that we've sourced and brought to Kodiak um, that we really only oper operate for six to eight weeks out of the year and then goes into storage. Um, so it's a lot of logistics and movement, um, but again, it, we have that flexibility so that we can match sort of what the kelp is looking like on any given year as to when we need to activate the, the plant. Um, but it also doesn't mean that we're tying up capital in owning a plant that is only being utilized six to eight weeks. Um, the last bit of that, the blast freezer, was an investment we made in the last two years. It's a 40-foot blast freezer. It sits on site. Our kelp is loaded in. Um, at the end of the day, sits in the blast freezer all night, and then we start the next day with a case up and palletize, palletization of, of uh, the finished product. So, you know, you can see all over the place where we're kind of piggybacking on uh, different packaging from the fish industry, you know, using wax cases. Um, the ventilation is key for um, getting the product frozen quickly. Um, this is the 20 pound, uh, one pound. 21 pound whole leaf cases that you see on the left. And then we load everything into uh, vans that are then uh, freighted off island where we warehouse in the lower 48 because that's where our markets are. Looking ahead uh, for 2023, there's a number of things that we're quite excited about um, that we're bringing online. Um, certainly continuous improvement is one of those. Uh, it pains me uh, as the operator that we have to wait sometimes 12 months to get another crack at improvement. Um, you know, this is just the life of um, an annual crop. Um, but every year we're looking to make tweaks and improvements in our process. Missy talked a lot about um, the, the water uh, content of kelp and shipping uh, water off island. That's a pain point that we all we know all too well. Uh, we currently, as I mentioned, uh, 
um, dry the sea lettuce that we grow and process in Mexico. So we have the technology and in 2023, um, we're finally going to act, going to activate a dry line for, for kelp. We have a lot of market feedback over the last 12 to 18 months that suggests that this is the form that um, a lot of our buyers want to see the kelp in. And so again, this will be another round of investment, both in process and in cash. Um, to get us to a place where we're processing kelp into a form that has market uh, potential. We're looking at sea, uh, species expansion. Um, there's been a lot of conversation um, circling around bull kelp. Uh, one of our farmers has an array of bull kelp and we're looking for the, forward to the opportunity to R&D the processing on that. And then continue, continual R&D, um, both in food, ag, and other markets. Um, trying to understand at the processing step for us as a company, how do we make sure that we have the practices in place that get us to the products that um, buyers want. And so that, that never stops for us. I think that's my last slide. I'll exit out of this so I can see everyone else and take any questions. Cool, thanks Nate. Does anyone have any questions? They say just let us know when you're coming to Cordova. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I think it was like two two years ago, Sky called or sent an email and said, we got help. Can you guys process it? And it was just such a hard call to say, no, we really can't. It, it, that process, of, or, you know, the time to get it to Kodiak so that we can process it just isn't, it doesn't work. Um, so we yep. heard that, and I hope that we can we can take what we're we're doing in Kodiak and find ways that make sense for us as a business uh, to be in some other communities in the state. Cool. Well, uh, Nate, I would really appreciate your input. Um, on the virtual front, we're gonna quit. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for participating in this workshop, and uh, I'm gonna be sending you a survey, and you better fill it out. <laughs> I will, I will. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you guys. Hope you guys have a good evening. Yeah. You too. Bye, Tommy. Bye, Eric. <laughs>